chapter 6, we're going to look today at just the first seven verses. Now, in those days, we read, when the number of disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenist, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them, and the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Lord, pour your spirit out as we dig into your word. I pray that every word I speak will bring clarity to the passage before us and simplicity to the understanding of what you want us to do with it and because of it. Bless your people today, Lord your flock, your family, this fellowship, your fellowship, as we open the word and study together. In Jesus' name, amen. I have missed praying with you too. We'll probably stop and do that a lot. And so if you're not in the habit, you're like, dude, they're prayed four times. Where are we? Um, outside. Look at this. This is the stuff God made. When we make something, we have to light it. When we're in his, his creation, it's already lit. Anyway, listen, God's word describes you who are in Christ Jesus in many wonderful ways. He describes us as a flock and us individually as his sheep. And he says, the good shepherd says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. They won't follow the voice of strangers because they don't know the stranger's voice. So today, if you can get past me and realize he's speaking to you through his word and by his spirit, hear his voice because it's here for us in the scriptures. Jesus calls us friends. So first his flock. And then his friends, he says, no longer do I call you servants, though every one of us is called to serve. Speaking to those first disciples and apostles, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant doesn't know what his master's up to. But I've told you everything I want you to know. And listen, Jesus has done the same for us. If you're new to, to uh, the study of the Bible, new to being a Christian or not yet a Christian, Read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the four Gospels. It will lead you to the book of Acts that we're studying right now. And in those Gospels, you will get the words of Jesus. Well, we're his flock. We're his friends. We're his family. We are called the children of God. And it's important to us because he does say um, elsewhere... In 1 John 3, 1, John records, Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us, that we might be called the children of God. Therefore the world doesn't know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it's not yet been revealed what we shall be like. But listen, we know when he is revealed, we will be like him. For we will see him as he is glorious promise Jesus flock Jesus friends Jesus family Jesus fellowship we are in the fellowship of his son Philippians 3 10 says we share in the fellowship of his sufferings and that's important at a time where so many are suffering and struggling isolation hasn't been good for everyone. In fact, it hasn't been good for very many. 
And I don't want to say how many of you really have enjoyed the isolation because, well, you'll put your hands up and people will look at you like, what? I've hated this. It's been the hardest thing I've ever dealt with. But, but listen, it's so important that we process this, that, that to, to function as family, to function as a fellowship, we need to be together. And you're his family, children of God, having been born again and adopted in. You're a part of the fellowship of the saints universally, but this fellowship locally and specifically. And God is working here and he's working everywhere where his word is taught and his gospels preached. So we're called his flock, his friends, his family, his fellowship. We're called Jesus church. And Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. What's that rock? The declaration, the proclamation, the revelation given to Peter. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And if you don't understand what those words mean, you want to get with one of the pastors or, or any of those you know that are, oh, I might need that. Uh, I really do need that. Who's... Look at there, we got a runner. Whoo, that's what we call that a runner. And uh, you will by no means lose your reward. All right. Woohoo! Okay. Well, Pam was right. I should have put something on this. Laminating next time. Anyway, for now we have these. Um, I, I, I remember these from when I was a kid. I'm just not, I can't remember what they were for. But anyway. I know you know, right? Those of you who are low tech, you still dry your clothes with these, right? Although I never understood how this could dry your clothes. So anyway, we're back in business. We're his flock, we're his friends, we're his family, we're his fellowship, we're his church called out by and separated to our Lord and Savior Jesus, that we could be with him first and foremost, and that we could go out to represent him, having been in his presence. Last two, and then we'll dig into these verses. Long introduction, that's unusual for me. Short study, even more unusual, so you can count on both. Jesus' bride, loved and chosen, redeemed and cleansed clothed in his righteousness. The bride of Christ, what a glorious picture. There's no picture of greater intimacy for all the other things he says we are to him and in him and because of him. His flock, his friends, his family, his fellowship, his church, his bride. And I have just one more for you. And it's the one we're looking at today, the body of Christ. Jesus tells us we are his body. And Paul tells us, that this body of which we're a part has a living head. That's really a good thing, by the way, because I've heard it said, a body without a head is dead. And so uh, you want to make sure that you're not just a part of the body, but attached to the head. Jesus is not just the living head of the body. He's the living heart of the body. He is the one who so loved that he gave his life for our sins, that whoever believes in him, oh, those can fly, did not, would not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, it lets me move around more. People are going to say, whoa, he's getting a little more Pentecostal. Um, very little more. Very, very little. So anyway, Jesus' body is a vital, living, growing organism, and each of us apart. Now, you should know everyone in the body is dependent on Jesus, but in the body of Christ, and this is the one thing that's unique among all these, well, ways he describes us, all the others speak purely of dependence on him. This part of, of, of being in him and, and a part of him, it requires dependence on one another because every part of the body is gifted and called and empowered to serve the other parts. Now, I had thought I might go into some depth on all this. I've decided not to do that. We'll have plenty of time going forward for such things. But I do want to say, if you're unfamiliar with 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, those passages would be very good for you to read. Jot it down or make a mental note. Because 
our challenge is to find our plan, uh, his plan, excuse me, and our part in our purpose in the body of Christ. So that when every part is in its place, doing what we've been fashioned and formed to do, what happens? The body not only functions as Jesus desires, but it looks like Jesus. Years ago, God gave me a picture of a puzzle and the puzzle was of Jesus. And when you put all the pieces in place, you saw him accurately. And that's so important for us as the body of Christ, a body locally, literally, um, you know, spiritually. Well, we've got to see it. Well, back to our passage, because that's my introduction. And again, if that's too long for an introduction, well, you live through it. Verse one, we read this in those days when the number, the number of disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Up to this point, God has added to his church. He has multiplied the believers. They've gone from, well, 120 to, to 3,120 and then another group and there were 5,000 and well, so he adds and he multiplies. We saw him subtract two hypocrites uh, last time. What did, were they uh, gracious and beautiful, now simply known as dead and rotting? But, but anyway, he, he killed two people who pretended to be posed as something they certainly were not. Generous, kind, caring, you know, giving people. And, and so if you missed that study, you're probably thinking, well, why would I want to listen to it? You, you could get a lot out of it, I promise you. In any case, we see another problem with real potential for the enemy to divide, to sow seeds of division. And you should know that whenever God's at work and God's always at work, Satan immediately comes in and wants to, well, disrupt what God is doing. Satan can't create anything, but, but he can, well, he can mess with God's creation. And that's really his goal to steal to kill and destroy. We're not gonna give them a lot of press, but I wanna say this. There was a legitimate complaint um, offered. Actually, the word for complaint here by the Hebrews, or against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, that word is translated most often to grumble or to murmur or to mutter. All of those are something you do under your breath. So, and, you know, you might be doing that, but no one will know you're doing it. When you complain, it's genuinely and generally out loud. And so uh, that's what's happening here. Now, the, this, you, you need to understand who these folks actually were. Hebrews, they're the people that grew up there in Israel. They are descendants of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob. And, and, uh, and, and they have been living in the land. They speak Aramaic. That's the, the common language at that time for Hebrew people. The scholars still spoke Hebrew, but the common people spoke Aramaic. And they also spoke Greek because that was the language that was universal in the day, much as English is today. And so what happened, we have these Aramaic speaking Jews and we have the Hellenists. They are Greek speaking Gentiles who had converted to Judaism and now had found Jesus Christ and become Christians. So they went from whatever they were as pagans, that's probably a good word for it. They were Greek pagans into something, but not, not the Lord. They find out that the Israelites know the true and living God. So they come and they don't just hang out with them. They become one of them. They, they're proselytes to Judaism. And then they hear the gospel preached. And, and on the day of, of um, there in the book of Acts chapter two, on the day when God first poured out his spirit on that great multitude, 3,000 people saved. They were people from all over, but they were in Jerusalem because it was the time of a feast. So these are two different groups, but understand they're all in the body of Christ. So it's the body fighting against the body. 
And, and, we, and there's been a little bit of that going on. I'm not saying here at Calvary Chico, although certainly here at Calvary Chico. But uh, no, we all have our own opinions about what's right and what's going on and how we should deal with it and, and what the government's doing. And listen, all that may be an issue, but the real issue is what is the Lord doing? What is the Lord saying? What does he want to accomplish in this time? And I have found more opportunity to share with my neighbors. And I live in a neighborhood where you can still walk. And, uh, and I do. And I have met so many of my neighbors. And, and they used to just, you know, kind of turn away. And I don't know if they know I'm a pastor or if the word got out. But all of a sudden, they're friendly. And isolation will do that to you. It will make even a person who prefers to be alone think I can't take much more of this. And those of you who don't prefer to be alone, you had that experience the first week. Anyway, with all that, it's so important to say the believers in the Jerusalem church, they had sold uh, land and, and houses. They, they brought the proceeds to the apostles. They distributed them as each had need. It led to that hypocrisy that we saw last time but it created a new problem. So the problem was a conflict between the, the, the Jewish, if you will, pure-blooded Jewish widows and those who had become a part of all that. Now both groups are in the church. And, and, uh, and, and the Hellenists feel like they're not, their widows aren't getting an equal and fair distribution. So the 12, this is the... the that's the problem. Verse 2 is the realization. The 12 summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, it's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. That word desirable is it's important to us. It, it, it doesn't mean they thought it was below them or it really wasn't something they would be willing to do. No, they'd been doing things like that and they were still willing. But here's the problem. That word desirable actually means it's neither reasonable nor right, especially in God's sight. Why? They had been called and gifted and sent by the Lord to accomplish certain things that he had really made possible for them and through them. So they say, it's not right. It's not reasonable. God's not going to be blessed if we leave. And it means to leave behind, to forsake, to abandon the ministry of the word in this case and serve tables. They weren't saying, hey, that's beneath us. You can't be a representative of Jesus and not be willing to serve because he is the greatest in the, the kingdom of God. He is the servant of all. And he says, if you want to be great, great. But here's greatness in God's eyes. It's not the one with the most servants. That's our culture. It's the one who serves the most. So they're not saying we are not called to serve. They're called serve in a specific way and it's a way where God would get the most glory where people would grow the most because he gifted them to teach his word and to preach the gospel and and to be men of prayer and we're going to see all that so it wasn't beneath them but it may and would have hindered them for what they knew they must do and this reminds us we need to be you know aware of the priorities we've set in our lives. And we need to, to be evaluating what the Lord wants us to do. And if there's anything we are doing that we shouldn't, and if there is anything we should be that we're not. Well, therefore, verse 3, moving from the problem and the realization to the solution. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. Listen, we see the wisdom of these early disciples and apostles, these representatives of Jesus, because they, they can solve this problem best by well, doing just what they do. They set the standards for those who are going to serve. 
But they let the Hellenist who had lodged the complaint in the first place choose those they knew could and would meet those standards. So don't miss this. They're giving us qualifications for men who are going to wait tables, who are going to serve and distribute food to needy widows. And I want to tell you, the qualifications are high. And, uh, well, he gives us a few. There are other lists. Paul expands on this and, and later in his writings, and we'll do that down the road. But for now, take note of this. The Hellenists chose the ones who would be serving, but the, the Hebrews set the standards. They looked for men of godly character. They weren't concerned how talented they were or how popular they were, if they could win, if it went to a vote. They were only concerned or initially concerned are these men with godly character, men who were trustworthy, men who have in, are of integrity, who are honest, who you can count on. And so Paul will write, hey, take these things I've given you and entrust them to faithful men who will be able to teach others. So they're looking for men of godly character, known to be men of good reputation. That word reputation, it was surprised. It surprised me. I don't know why. Oh, I know, because I don't remember everything I used to know. That's not just because I'm older, although I'm sure that's a factor. None of us remember everything we learn, but I especially don't remember everything I learned in the Greek since I don't speak Greek. The word, though, is marturo. That might sound a little familiar to you. We get our word martyr from it. So he says, we want men who are martyrs. I like that a lot. It means to be a witness in your words, in your ways, in your works, in your life. And even unto death, if it becomes necessary, and spoiler alert, that's going to happen. These people are going to wait tables. That will lead to further and greater opportunities and greater only in the sense that they've got the widows that they're distributing to. And when that work's done, crowds will gather around them and, and want to know some stuff. And there will be opportunity for them to speak and preach and share. So, again, they look for men of godly character, of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit. Why? We can never accomplish the work and will of God and the energies of our flesh. Every time the Spirit is poured out on these disciples and these apostles, and now we're going to see upon these, well, they're called the first deacons, and whether they are or aren't, they do set the stage for the ministry of the deacon, which is simply to take care of all the physical needs. And I want to say the gang that, is it okay to call them a gang? The group, maybe not today, but the group that gathered to pray and plan and prepare and set all this up for you, it was a massive amount of godly people filled with the Spirit, most of the time and uh and but but listen it's so important to be grateful that we can even do this and because i was in on it from the beginning of the planning all the way to today i am exceedingly grateful to every single person who served and those who volunteered in it it turned out we had more servants than we actually needed I don't believe that will always be the case. So if you're like, I want to help, and they're like, well, we're okay. Keep saying you want to help because we're going to keep going. We're doing one service this morning. And if all the technology works, after this, we're just going to celebrate that we did it. And we're going to post it online. It should be live right now. If it doesn't work, well, then we'll be going into a cold and dark and, and damp room and uh, recording in private that which will go out to everyone. Anyway, where are we in all of this? They look for men of godly character, of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and the wisdom of God. The word wisdom is translated interesting ways in both Old and New Testament. It means skill and wise management, sound judgment, good common sense. 
Today we call it uncommon sense. It used to just be people knew the word and they tried to live in obedience to it. So many today ignorant of the word. They've just never heard. No one's ever given them a Bible and say, hey, I want to gift you this. This book's changed my life. It's changed my world. It's changed my family. It's changed my destiny. Listen, it's a simple gift. And while people are still not all getting out, take advantage of it. Order some Bibles, go pass them out, maybe wear gloves and put a cover or something. You know, the people are a little paranoid and I understand that. Well, anyway, it's so important that they had the wisdom of God because the wisdom of man is foolishness to God. The wisdom of man, it leads people away, not towards God and not to God. But Paul, again, will later expand what all that means and looks like. We're not looking at Paul right now. He's not yet saved at this time. He's a persecutor of the church. But we are looking in those first chapters, these first chapters, at those first apostles and how God used them. And now the deacons and how God will use them. Again, and we'll move to our, uh, you know, verse 4 and then the, the results. This is still the solution. They didn't look for gifted men because that wasn't really the issue. God gifts everyone to do something. But as Christians, we represent the servant of all who served and suffered and died for us. So they weren't concerned with how gifted and again, how popular or how, how whatever it might be. They were looking for men who wanted to be great in the kingdom of God. And the greatest in the kingdom of God is the servant of all. So every blood bought, born again, alive in him, Christian is called and equipped and empowered to serve. Our Lord and Savior served us. He served us all the way to the cross. He didn't just meet daily needs. He met the greatest need. When he gave his life for our sin. So we who follow him, we who represent him, we must be willing to do the same. Now they say, here's what we're going to do instead of wait tables. We will give ourselves, verse 4, continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. That word ministry reminds us that, that, that prayer and the word they're a part of the ministry and they're actual ministries for those called to teach and preach and explain and exhort as we go through the word of God. And I'm so grateful for the many here, not just our pastors and elders, but for the many who've taught from the youngest all the way to the eldest for some for decades and many of you just Becoming a part of all that, they're saying we're going to give ourselves continually to prayer. Why? Jesus was a man of prayer. He had a lifestyle of prayer. And we who serve him must follow his example. A lifestyle of the ministry of the word. It's the same word that was used for serving tables. So they're saying we're not going to be serving this way because that's not going to be pleasing God more than if we serve this way. And they wanted to please and glorify God as we all should want to do. So we'll give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. Studying, discussing, debating. Listen, they were reading, explaining, teaching, preaching, exhorting, obedience in season and out of season, when it was convenient and inconvenient. That brings me to my last point. Verses five through seven, the results, the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. And Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they prayed, they laid hands on them. Stephen, a short but very powerful ministry for the Lord. We will look at him next time specifically. But you want to know he served for a very short time, but now he has eternity with the Lord. Philip will be used by God to minister to the Samaritans who were despised by Jews. 
and then to get the gospel to the Ethiopians. We'll see that in chapter 8. Prochorus means leader of the chorus. Yeah, pro-chorus. And we know him as one of the seven. God knows the rest. And get this, these other guys, their names are, are recorded here, but they, we really don't know anything about them except... They were called to serve and wait tables to meet needs. And so their names are here in the book. But I want to say, though, our names will never be written in this book. We're in a more important book, and theirs were as well. It's called the Lamb's Book of Life, because the day of judgment will come. And all of us will stand in one of two judgments. And those of us who are in the Lamb's Book of Life, well, we're going to be rewarded for our works, because that's what God will judge. And he'll judge not just what we did, but our motivation in doing it. We looked at that last time. It's a huge issue for God. It should be a bigger one for us. In the midst of all of that, their names are recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. Because every born-again sinner washed in the blood of a sinless, spotless Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world is in the Lamb's Book of Life. Well, all who stand before him, who have been born again, who've been forgiven sin, who are in Christ Jesus, and that's where we started with that amazing a statement of three words, we're in Christ Jesus. Ephesians will say all our blessings are in Christ Jesus. Our hope is in Christ Jesus. Our faith is in Christ Jesus. But all of that to say those who die without him die with die in their sin, and when they stand before God, they're not going to hear in Christ Jesus, they're going to hear, depart from me. I want to make sure that doesn't happen to you. And I'm going to give you an invitation in a moment, an opportunity, if you haven't given your life to the Lord Jesus, to do that here and now. Those of you who are logged in, who are watching online, or listening on the radio, or whatever medium this is on for you, in a moment, I'll pray a prayer, and I want you to pray this prayer with me. Before I do, verse 7 says, The word of God spread. The number, number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Here's why this is oh so important. He's been multiplying disciples, and, and they've been growing but the priests are adversaries. They're, they're accusers. They're working for the enemy. And all of a sudden we read, many of them are coming to faith as well. Don't give up on anyone. Pray for everyone. And you don't have to share the same message day in and day out with them. But you do need to live like you believe it. Like Jesus is real for you and to you. And that your life is really in Christ Jesus. Lord, I thank you for being with us. I thank you for honoring us with your presence. For blessing us with the knowledge that you inhabit the praises of your people. And Lord, I am so, 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 so grateful today that we can meet here in this beautiful venue, in this fresh air that we can enjoy worship and study together. And I pray, Lord, that, that this pandemic will come to an end, that they'll find a way to, to deal with it and, and keep people from getting it, keep us from getting it. We pray protection on all our families and friends. And Lord, we, we pray that you'll continue to bless us as we walk with you and represent you. May your word take root and produce fruit in the heart of everyone in Christ Jesus. And if you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus, listen, I want you to pray these simple words after me. Repeat them out loud after me. It's for your good and your sake. Wherever you are, here, there, or every or anywhere, pray these words. Heavenly Father, I've heard you're a loving, merciful Father. And I've heard that these around me are children of God. And I want to become your child. 
I know I'm a guilty sinner. I understand the wages of sin is death. And I've heard the gift of God, everlasting life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I give you my life because you gave your life for me. I'll live my life for you because you died for my sins. You were buried. You rose again. I surrender to you. I yield myself, who I am, and all I can be. I'm in your hands. Transform me, renew me, and then use me to your glory. In Jesus' precious name, amen. If you prayed that prayer here, we wanna know about it. And I'm gonna ask you to do something very bold since we're you know, out here and it's just, I don't know, I'm not, while we are worshiping and we're all gonna stand in a moment and worship, while we're doing that, if you prayed for the very first time to give your life to the Lord Jesus, I want you to come and stand down here. That way we can be sure to meet you and sure to greet you and sure to get a Bible to you today so you can read having given your life to Christ, having been born again of his spirit, forgiven all sin, washed in the blood of the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. If you're out there in, in a media land, let us know you prayed to receive, receive Jesus. We wanna get a Bible to you. We have many ways to do that, but we need to know where you are and who you are so we can connect.